Interesting. If you were, are we live yet? Do we know? We are? Okay. In fact, everybody real quick, turn around at that red light. And let's just wish everybody who's joining us Shabbat Shalom. Don't you wish you were here? All righty. Let's go to the Father in prayer and just ask his continued blessings on our weekend. Amen. Our Father in heaven, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, thank you. Thank you so much for all you do for your people. Thank you for what you do through your people. We are so grateful. We're so privileged. We are blessed. We are honored that you call us your sons and daughters. May everything we do today bring honor to your name. May we sanctify your great name. Father, I pray that your shalom would just sweep over us, bathe us in your peace, and that all of the, the scurrying about and all the activity and all the things that had to be overcome just to get here this weekend, the, those of your people who've traveled from the Pacific Coast and the Northeast and the upper Midwest all over this country to be here. We've come here for one reason, to honor you, to bless you. And we desire that your presence would be here with us and abide with us. Help us to lay aside every care, every thought of things that may be uh, facing us next week. Everyone who's come in tired, weak, sick, heal them, Father strengthen them rejuvenate them father those who may have come here discouraged be the lifter of their head and help us all to be able to raise holy hands unto you unfettered by the cares of this world so that we can truly focus all of our energy our, our, our everything about us upon being with you and we pray this and we believe this because we've come to you in the name that is above all names, Yeshua, our salvation, our redeemer, and our soon coming king. It's in his name. Amen and amen. Just remain standing.
we could have the watchman assemble, please. I'm going to tell you what I believe, what I feel in my heart as it relates to what the Father is doing in this area, in this region, in this, not just this part of the country, but this part of Tennessee, in this town. I have heard for many, 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 many years about a prophecy that was specific to this area that in the last days the Father was going to raise up people in this area. That was, he was going to bring a great revival to this area and there were going to be things that were going to come out of this area that the Father was going to do in the last days. And with all due respect to those who see it maybe slightly differently than I and not discounting their view of it but I am convinced that what we're doing this weekend and what the Father is doing through his people is part of that prophecy being fulfilled and that the Father is going to use the people that are listening to his voice and responding to that call He's going to do something in and through their lives. And I want to be a part of whatever it is he's got going on. Amen. So when these men and women sound the shofar and we hear that call, let it also be a representative of our response. If he says he's calling us, then our response is, Hidedi, here I am. Amen. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat 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 Shalom Shabbat Shalom Shabbat Shalom Shabbat 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 Shalom Shabbat 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 Shalom Shabbat 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 Shalom Shabbat Shalom Shabbat Shalom Shabbat 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 Shalom Shabbat Shalom Shabbat Shalom Shabbat 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 Shalom Shabbat 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 Shalom Shabbat 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 Shalom Shabbat Shalom Shabbat Shalom Shabbat 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 Shalom Shabbat Shalom Shabbat Shalom Shabbat 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 Shalom Shabbat 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 Shalom Shabbat 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 Shalom Shabbat Shalom Shabbat Shalom Shabbat 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 Shalom Shabbat Shalom Shabbat Shalom 
Shabbat 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 Shalom. Good morning. Boker Tov. Man, he's gonna stop playing guitar next to me, y'all. <laughs> you ready? He named my tov, who my name. Dang on. That's just good. Shevet a king on Yakai. He named my tov.
I'll give Mr. Paul Wilbur a hand for helping us out this morning, y'all. So, I gotta work on my Hebrew because I think I'm pronouncing Shevet, Shevet, according to Paul. Every time we do that, he asks me, did you say Shevet or Shevet? Well, I just gotta say how happy it makes my heart to see the circle go all the way out into the lobby and out the other door because we just have that many people here today. How special is that? How do our dancers feel with all this space? Dance your hearts out this weekend, okay? Here we go.
school there. Sing, oh, precious. Oh, precious is the
Knowing who he is, a way maker.
This is our prayer this morning. Oh God, you are our God, and we will ever praise you. Oh God, you are our God, and we will ever praise you. We will seek, and we will seek you.
and all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. Shout your praise, our hearts will cry, these bones will sing.
If you had spent your entire life under the watchful eye of an oppressor and your day was determined by someone else and it was without any kind of compensation other than an insult or a whip on your back or some other violent expression. If you had lived that way all of your life and then overnight, you were liberated from that and you were free. I guarantee you, your response would not be, meh. You would be leaping, you would be jumping, you would be twirling, you would be waving banners, you would be singing, shouting to the top of your lungs, and you wouldn't care who was looking and who was watching to see what you were doing because all you would be focused on is I am free. And so I want you right now to express that to, this, to the Almighty who has set us all free. Amen. Can we do that? Amen. So if your congregation is a little quiet and if subdued and you're wondering what in the world have we walked into, you have walked into what the Father is doing in Jacob's tent in Cleveland, Tennessee. 
and all of the folks who join us online. Amen. Amen. Just remain standing, and if you will, we're going to continue with our service. And uh, if we can bring up the Vishamru, and I want us all to, to share this together and recite this, and it's coming any moment. There it is. I don't want this just to be a recitation. I want this to be, this is what we believe. We are, we are doing and honoring what the Father has called us to do. Amen? So let's, let's declare this together. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily, my Sabbaths you shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that you may know that I am the Lord that doth sanctify you. And I want you to just stop and think for just a moment. He said it is a sign. It is an oath. We talked about an oath last night. Those signs between he and his people are very, very important. And so we are honoring him this day. And this that we do is a sign between us and him. Amen. Wherefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. In Mark chapter 12, one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together and perceiving that he'd answered them well, asked him, what is the most important commandment out of all of them? And Yeshua answered him, the first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And the second, like it, is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Gentlemen. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Ladies. All of the family now. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad Baruch Shem Kavod Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Blessed be his name and his glorious kingdom forever. And you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, with all of your strength. Ve'ahavta l'recha kamocha. You 
shall love your neighbor as yourself. And upon these two commandments stands a whole law. Love your neighbor, love your God. They are Havta, sing it out now. They are Havta et Adonai Elohecha Becholevavcha Uvechol Nafshecha Uvechol Meutecha And you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart with all of your soul with all of your mind with all of your strength amen why don't you take just a moment to greet someone take say hello shake a hand bump an elbow hug their neck meet somebody new Alrighty, if we could get all of our little itty bitties to come on down here and gather under the chuppah. I don't think we're going to get all of them under here, but we're gonna, we're gonna do our best. So come on down, all of our sons and daughters, children, grandchildren, squeeze in tight. Those of you on the ends, kind of move to the middle a little bit if you can, as more are coming in. If we run out of room, he's got a hoopah over us called the heavens. We'll just, <laughs> we'll use that. Come on in. Squeeze on in as much as you can. I know it's, we're running out of room, but. Uh... I'm not really sure how big of a hoopah we're gonna have to come up with in the future, but it's gonna have to be a pretty good sized one.
So all of you who are at home, if your children or grandchildren are with you, gather them close to you. All of you who are here, moms, dads, everyone out here in the, in the seats, please stand with me if you can and will. And I want us to all extend our hands to our children and our grandchildren. This is not just something we do because it's the custom and routine. This is a blessing and a prayer that we are pronouncing on our sons and daughters, knowing, knowing that our Father hears in heaven and that he responds. Many of us, myself included, are living demonstrations of the fact that he will respond to the prayer of a mother and a father for their children. And that that we are depositing in our children, it will not leave them. It will not leave them. And we like to pray here that those of our children who aren't here, they're somewhere else, not just in geography, but they're somewhere else in their relationship with the Father. We pray, as we pray this blessing on these children here and those who are at home, we pray that the Father will go where we can't go and he'll meddle in their life, he'll mess their lives up, he'll interfere, he'll do what he has to do to get their attention, to turn their face and their heart back to him, amen? So let's pray this blessing upon our children. May the Lord protect and defend you And may He always shield you from shame And may you come to be in Israel a shining name And may you be like Ruth and like David may you be deserving of praise strengthen them O Lord and keep them from the strangers ways and may God bless you and grant you long lives and may God make you good husbands and wives may the Lord protect and defend you May the Lord preserve you from pain. Favor them, O Lord, with happiness and peace. Oh, hear our Sabbath prayer. Father, we thank you for these that you have entrusted to us, our sons, our daughters, our grandchildren. And we do believe that from your throne in the heavens, you hear our prayer and you acknowledge this blessing that we place upon them. And Father, may it be that all of the gifts and talents that you've created within each and every one of them would always serve you to, to fulfill your purpose and will. And may this generation that is coming up right now be a generation that will be unafraid of this world, that will be bold and courageous because they've heard your voice that says, do not fear them, do, do not be dismayed by them because I, the Lord, will go before you. May this generation of young people, Father, be a warrior generation and take ground from the adversary that the, lip, that the captives will be liberated and those in bondage will be set free and that the authority of Yeshua, our Messiah and King would continue to expand and encroach and destroy the kingdom of darkness. Work in and through these young people, Father, we pray in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. All righty, you can return to your seats. And while you're going back to your seats, I want to invite Crystal Ann. 
and her team to come up onto the stage. And they are going to bless us with a special presentation. And so as soon as you can, get to your seat, take your seat, and then we're going to give them our attention. While they're getting ready, I want to say something very quickly about... Now, this gentleman on the drums, I'm sorry, I don't know very well. But these two guys over here on the keyboard and on the bass, Gabe Bello, you've met before. But you haven't met his brother, Ralph, before. So Gabe Bello, Ralph Bello, these two men were in our youth group when Beth and I were youth pastors in Deland, Florida, back when we were 12, you know. But it's, it's, uh, it's amazing to see that these two young men have become men, their fathers. Ralph, you said you have one in college? That just can't possibly be true. But anyway, and I'm sorry, please forgive me. Uh, Matt, Matt's on the drums. Let's give these three gentlemen a big hand. Thank you, sir. Let's give Crystal Ann and her team our attention.
Amen. Every language is going to praise him. Amen. Let's once again thank these ladies and gentlemen for leading us in an expression of worship that I need to learn. <laughs> I'll add that to the list. Well, again, Shabbat Shalom, everybody. Are you glad to be here? And once again, Shabbat Shalom to all of those who are joining us online. Uh, we had uh, several thousand that joined us online last night, and I want to thank you Ladies and gentlemen that were here last night, I want to thank you for your patience and just being flexible and understanding. Um, I don't know who it was, but somebody came up with the idea, that let's open it up to 750 people. I'm going to have to have a talk with that guy at some point but uh, <laughs> about some things. But no, we appreciate you just kind of being, being very flexible and, and uh, being very patient with us. So give yourselves a big hand, okay? Thank you. Um, most of you are familiar with Halissa Elwine. Um, where's Alan? Hiding? Where's he at? Stand up, Alan. Oh, you are standing up, Alan. <laughs> Stand up again, Alan. I want everybody to meet Mr. Alan Elwine. Stand up. I know. I, I hey, <laughs> I'll cut your electricity off at the ca at camper. No, I'm just playing. <laughs> Alan doesn't like a whole lot of attention, which is why I did that. But no, we appreciate him very much, and we appreciate his wife, Alyssa, and many of you are familiar with her ministry. And I, I, I said this when she was with us at Hanukkah. I want to say it again. You know, when I was a little one, I learned from my mother, and I learned from my grandmother. And when I got older, I met my wife, and I've learned a lot from her. <laughs> and the point being is I have, the Father has put women in my life, and I, gentlemen, women have been placed in your life also. Not only to assist you and not to, not only just to be by your side and support you, but to also in certain situations to share things with us that we need to learn. Amen, gentlemen? Amen. And all the husbands said? Amen. All right. So I want you to know that I have appreciated Halissa's ministry and her teaching and the things that she has shared through the years. And I just want everybody to know that Beth and I support her 110%. So Halissa Elwine, will you please come to the platform? Let's give her a big hand. And she's gonna share with us for a little while. I don't know what it is, but I guarantee you, you'll be going, huh, when it's all said and done. <laughs> Chag Pesach Sameach. Shabbat Shalom. I wasn't sure if it was a one menorah or two menorah Shabbat, so I came prepared. You guys been having a good time so far? There was just that wonderful spirit of unity last night. Um, you could sense it. I don't know if you guys could, but I certainly could. And um, I just appreciate the invitation. Uh, it's, you know, the rabbis, when they're, they're writing about end times, you know, they can hit some things right on the head that make you scratch your head. And they predicted a worldwide plague right before the footsteps of Messiah. We're coming through a worldwide plague. Right? But they also talk about during the time of the footsteps that the people of righteousness will be formed into little flocks as they await the gathering into that one large flock. And I think we've been seeing that happen before our very eyes. 20 years ago, we were teacher rich and pastor poor. And now we can begin to see these little flocks that they predicted forming as we await the footsteps of Messiah. And if you have found your little flock, then support it. 
if you have a pastor, see, I, I, don't, I do not have a pastor's heart. I'm more like, if you got blisters on your feet, put a Band-Aid on it and limp along. You know, it's, it'll be fine. <laughs> but we need pastors. That's important in the body. And uh, if you don't have a Band-Aid, I'll get you one if you'll quit complaining, right? <laughs> But this is what we need. We need these gifts working within the body. And as these little flocks form, it's going to be more and more important for people with pastor's hearts to be able to pull those flocks together and to be able to weather the coming days. I don't believe they're going to get better for a while. I think, they, um, I think as we're going into these times, it's going to squeeze us so hard that it's going to show us who we are. He already knows who we are. We don't always know what's inside of us till the pressure's on. I found that out this morning with my iPad. Uh, so we're going to use the laptop with the puppy slobber on the front. Um, but I just want to kind of fill in with what Bill said, you know, about the, the joy. Because I got to thinking this morning about restore to me the joy of my salvation. And this is Passover. We tend to think of it as a season of freedom. But if you think about Passover, if you're coming out of this period of bondage, then sometimes it's hard to really feel the joy when it's so fresh, when the pain is so fresh. Maybe how many of you were scared into salvation? that you felt like you were kind of dangled over hell. And so you jumped into salvation so you wouldn't go to hell primarily. But it talks about the joy of salvation. So once you experience that freedom of your salvation, it's not always easy to engage the joy of Sukkot. It's the season of our joy. But have you noticed how many times Passover and Sukkot are joined together in scripture? You keep Passover in remembrance of when he brought you out of Egypt. When Yeshua rides into Jerusalem, they're throwing palm branches before him. He wants us to see how these two things are connected because it's not just escaping bondage and being relieved that you're not going to hell. He wants to bring you into a season of freedom and joy and joy. Their first stop after they left Egypt, Ramses and Sukkot. He brings you to Sukkot so that you can find that joy. I hate to quote this guy, but he's telling us we don't have to live like a refugee. <laughs> right? <laughs> you got... <laughs> That's probably as close to a joke as we'll get today. We, know, we already know how those jokes go, okay? But that's just it. We, we come into the, a greater understanding of the word and we start using words we never did before like Torah and Yeshua and Shabbat. We've got a whole new vocabulary, but some of us get wound pretty tight, right? Because there was a whole new world of the word out there and we thought, I've been reading the Bible my whole life. I had no idea all this stuff was in there. I didn't know the richness and the depth of it. I didn't know the joy of Shabbat yet. And now I do, and what else am I missing? So we do, you know, as they say in Kentucky, we get wound tighter in a banjo string, right? <laughs> and then we start obsessing over, we gotta do it just like this, we gotta do it just like this. But did you notice last night what unity there was? When I'm pretty sure if we, you know, polled the room, everybody would have said, well, I would've just, one this little thing I would've done differently. Nobody did that. We were all in the same spirit. We were in unity. And that's what Yeshua is returning for. Because we're all gonna make mistakes. It's okay if you make, if you stumble a little bit, you're not going to stumble so as to fall, right? There's a difference between stumbling and falling. So we, we gotta get unwound a little bit. This is the season of freedom and joy. He's restoring to us the joy of our salvation because we can seek Sukkot from here. We can enter into eternity. Entering into these feasts is like entering into the kingdom itself where there is no time. It's timeless. These days aren't subtracted from your years. And so I ran across something last week, which has nothing to do with what I wanted to teach on, but... I ran across something in the Midrash Rabbah 
that had to do with Ezekiel's bones. And if you'll remember, he says, son of man, can these bones live? And Ezekiel says, Lord, you know. Well, now let's fast forward to Peter. Oh, I'm never going to betray you, Lord. I'm never going to make a mistake in the Torah, right? I'm never going to stumble. I'm never going to deny you. And Yeshua says, yes, you will. This is a guy who walked with Yeshua, folks. He says, yeah, you're going to betray me. And then he did. And afterward, Yeshua is sitting there with the disciples. He says, Peter, do you love me? He said, yes, Lord. You know I love you. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord. You know I love you. Peter, do you love me? Three times. What did that remind Peter of? The betrayals. And he says, Lord, you know. You know. What does that even mean? Lord, you know. Well, according to this Midrash, knowing in that context, it's kind of switched from what we understand in English. In fact, it's completely backward. When we look at wisdom, understanding, and knowledge, you just have to flip those around to get the, the Hebrew intent of those words. But it's experiential. It's a sacrificial love. It's a deep knowing that, that even modern Hebrew, the rabbis will tell us, it doesn't do justice to what knowing means. And he says, Lord, you know. In other words, Lord, you can resurrect these bones. Just like Ezekiel said, he's quoting Ezekiel, basically. Lord, you know you can make these bones live. And Yeshua has resurrected. And now Peter gets it. Lord, you know you can resurrect my bones. Even after we make big mistakes, he can resurrect these bones because he knows us. It's experiential. It's sacrificial if we'll walk after that. So back to, that was maybe for me. I don't know if that blessed you, but I, I've made mistakes. And I have betrayed him. But nevertheless, Lord, you know you can resurrect these bones. I don't have to live like a refugee, right? Because we'll make mistakes when we do that. We'll make more mistakes when we're wound that tight. It's a relationship. So I wanted to look at um, the Song of Songs. It's the traditional reading for Pesach. And we thought we would do a quick study in the Song of Songs a couple years ago. And as it turns out, we're still in chapter two. Uh, 87 lessons to my count. But chapter two is really rich because the text here is, my beloved is mine and I am his. He pastures his flock among the lilies. Now that's beautiful. It's pastoral. That's the, on the top of Mount Arbel, kind of looking on the other side of the Galilee. And so we can imagine him as a shepherd. But actually in chapter 2 of the Song of Songs, if you just want to scan through it, if you brought real Bibles, um, you can see that it emphasizes three relationships. The father, right? Uh, the relationship of children with the father, the avot. In Hebrew, av is father, avot is fathers in Hebrew. So it's going to emphasize this unique beloved relationship between the father and the children of Israel. So that's one identity that we have, father, children. The second relationship that it emphasizes is the shepherd, the shepherd and the sheep. But it, you see it's kind of reciprocal there too because He's the great shepherd of the sheep, but Israel, when they went down into Egypt, they were known as a shepherd nation. And that's how they got kind of preferential treatment in terms of their territory, because they were shepherds, which were abhorrent to the Egyptians. And then we have uh, the watchmen, which I love that 
with the, the shofars, calling them the watchmen, because the, the trumpets and the shofars, they are blown over the feasts. They're blown at these special times to bring us awake, to tell us there's a battle going on, to call us to assemble, all sorts of things going on with the shofars. But there is an identity there of he is, of course, uh, the one who guards Israel. But we are also called to be watchmen on the walls, the watchmen of Jerusalem. And so if we know the Sabbath and the high Sabbath, that kind of puts us in that role of being the watchmen and women on the walls. How many of you know the women helped build the walls of Jerusalem when they went back? Isn't that cool? It even names, you know. Uh, the, the district where they worked. And I'm not sure exactly what they did. If they were like me, they might have just passed the bucket. But, <laughs> uh, but yeah, very much a part of repairing the breaches in the walls. But if we put this back into the context, especially of, of Nehemiah, we know that one thing that he had to do, of course, is rebuild the walls to those who said it couldn't be done. He had to demonstrate it could be done. But what he also had to do was stop the commercial activity coming into Jerusalem on the Shabbat. And he had to set watchmen at the gates to make sure that this traffic of bringing the goods into Jerusalem stopped on the Shabbat. But what I love about New Jerusalem, you don't have to shut the gates because nobody's going to be violating anyway. This goes back to the joy of salvation, right? Instead of just being glad you got saved from hell. There's a joy in engaging his word, just like Yeshua said, if you love me, keep my commandments. There is this love relationship that we don't want to stop with just being free. We want him to restore joy in our salvation. So he has to restore the Shabbat in a way. He has to guard it. He has to put these watchmen at the gates and the walls. And he does. So there's three relationships there. There's going to be father to child, shepherd to sheep, and then, of course, the watchman on the walls. And then the next slide that I had was actually the Veshamru, which we already did. So I'm not going to belabor that point. But this is what's identified with Shabbat, is this piece of liturgy called Veshamru. It's guarding the Sabbath, protecting the Sabbath. Why? Because it proclaims who the Creator is. There is no other God, right? The, the first commandment tells you who. The greatest commandment tells you how. And the Sabbath tells you when, right? They all work together. And so this reminds us every Shabbat about being that watch person for the Sabbath, protecting that holy boundary. So we won't read through that again, but we know, just like uh, Paul was reminding us last night, the Moedim were set in place on the fourth day of creation. Before there was a human being to observe them, there were the appointed times. Well, as we get into the, the next chapter of Genesis, we go from this linear understanding, day one, day two, day three, day four, day five, day six, day seven, and all of the sudden right there, it starts describing the description, describing the description, describing the rivers of Eden in their circular pattern, in their circular flow. It talks about uh, even Revelation, how a river ran from beneath the throne. Well, in Genesis, the river, it ran down and it watered the whole garden. It ran out of Eden and watered the whole garden. That doesn't make sense on its face unless you understand that this lower garden was a mirror of the upper garden. And therefore, the water flowing from beneath that throne was flowing down into the garden of Eden. And so I've got a little graphic. I don't know if it'll work for you. But it, it just kind of demonstrates... Again, not just the way that Genesis 2 is describing how those rivers flow. They survive. They go round and round. But it's also describing to you how it corresponds to the feasts. How if the, the spirit, and remember river, water represents spirit. 
If the spirit is not moving through these feasts, we got a problem. Right? We got dry ground, and that's not good at the feasts. But these appointed times were from the beginning. Right? And once you understand how those rivers flow, you'll understand why the appointed times are so important. Because even though he can do anything, anytime he wants to, he's decided he wants appointed times for things. Right? And so once we kind of get how those rivers flow, how they work, how they go around in these circles, or how they survive, and then we understand Ezekiel's wheels, right? How one could move within the other, right? It's that way. The spirit was in the Garden of Eden, and it was flowing through those rivers. Yeshua stands up at Sukkot, right, on the last great day. He says, if anybody's thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He's referring you back again to the rivers of Eden. You can be restored. Your dry bones can live. You can be resurrected back to that garden. And so that's our goal, right? We want to be garden ready. We want to be prepared to live in that garden because I suspect if Adam and Eve were kicked out for nonconformance, then he's not going to allow us to be there as rebels and nonconformers. We're going to have to figure out how to go with the plan, how to become obedient. And Yeshua is the key to that. He's saying, with the power of the Spirit, he says, I can make you stand in that place. Right? So there was a plan to bring mankind back into synchronization with the move of the Spirit, with the appointed times and so forth, so that mankind could be restored to the garden. Because before we have all sorts of people groups, we just have a human being, right? We're the, we're the ones at this point making a lot of distinctions that don't need to be made. We're just standing before Elohim, our Creator. That's what Shabbat says. It says, I'm just standing before Elohim, my Creator. And Isaiah 63, 16, it says, For you are our father, although Abraham does not know us and Israel does not recognize us. You, our Lord, are our father. I think that describes a lot of us. We feel like, well, maybe Abraham wouldn't recognize me. But see, faith is how Abraham came in. And if you came in to the covenant through faith, then Abraham will recognize you when you come into the garden. It says even Israel doesn't recognize us. Well, they didn't recognize Joseph either. But you have to start doing things that are consistent with the word and allowing the spirit to move through you, and all of a sudden, the lights might go on. They might recognize something shining out of you that is familiar. Jeremiah 31.9 and of course, that's the father relationship of chapter two of the Song of Songs. It says, with weeping, they will come, and by supplication, I will lead them. I will make them walk by streams of waters on a straight path in which they will not stumble. For I am a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. Hear the word of the Lord, O nations, and declare in the coastlands afar off, and say, he who scattered Israel will gather him and keep him as a shepherd keeps his flock. You see how Jeremiah hit all three points in one little paragraph there? The father to the child, the watchman, the keeper, and the shepherd. So those three relationships are very important for us to understand. If we're looking for the footsteps of Messiah, you say, well, why are you calling footsteps of Messiah instead of the tri tribulation? Well, doesn't it sound better? I mean, seriously, don't you think at this point you're hearing something different than most of the world? It's all about bad news. We've got plague. We've got war. The famine is already here, whether you know it or not. We're already off the cliff, Wiley Coyote. We just haven't looked down yet. Okay. That's coming because famine in Hebrew is ra'ev. It means to be hungry. 
It doesn't necessarily mean that there's not going to be any rain all over the world, although there is a prediction of how that is going to happen, how the rain will fall in certain areas and it won't in others. But the third year of the famine, they say, is supposed to be the absolute worst. And then in the fourth year, they say for the righteous, it'll start to pull out. And we will begin to experience something different than the rest of the world at that point. At any rate, it's seen as the footsteps of Messiah, even though I know people have made a fortune off the Great Tribulation. I, I too, was scared witless by the late great planet Earth when I was in eighth grade. So uh, I think it scarred me. At any rate, this is good news. Because these footsteps of Messiah, this is actually the, one of the key texts that they're looking at. And it's going to be uh, Nahum or Nahum, depending on which part of the south you're from. Uh, Nahum 115 says, Behold on the mountains the feet of him who brings good news, mountains or nations, who announces peace. Celebrate your feasts, O Judah. Pay your vows. When do you pay your vows? In ancient times. Passover, Shavuot, Sukkot. Right? So it's giving you again the feast GPS right here. And who specifically is being addressed? Judah. You can say it. It's okay. It's, it's all right. <laughs> Don't get wound too tight on me now. <laughs> it's Judah. So there's a leadership role right here. It doesn't mean ownership. It means leadership. And so in that leadership, Judah is going to be the one who will preserve the Shabbat. Judah is going to be the one who's going to preserve the feasts. He's going to know the appointed times. And what is going to be the result of this? For never again will the wicked one pass through you. He is cut off completely. Now that just switched from, oh wow, good news, Messiah on the mountains, to wait a minute, we just cut off the wicked one. How'd that happen? Well, there's an association in the context. Remember, in the beginning, it was just a human being on the Shabbat. No tribes, no nations, just a human being and his creator. And so he's restoring us back to that. He said, how do you want to cut off the wicked one? I, I, right now, I, I'm pretty sure there's more than one wicked one. There's, there's bunches of wicked ones. But in every generation, there's going to be this negotiation. There's going to be someone who will rise up and attack. In the time of Egypt, of course, it's Pharaoh. And if you notice this long negotiation they keep having back and forth, it's about going to celebrate a feast. Moses says, let us go celebrate a chag. Chagim are typically going to be Passover, Shavuot, Sukkot. The Moedim more likely to include all seven, if you look at them in context. So what is Moses saying? The feast is going to be a key to breaking this bondage. How do we go from bondage to the bondservants of the Most High? What's the key? What does Moses tell us the key is? Celebrate a chag. And you can do it even in the wilderness. In fact, the, the rabbis talk about a wilderness of the peoples. In other words, it's not going to be specifically down in the Negev, wandering around in this particular location. They say, in the time of the footsteps of Messiah, there will be a wilderness of the peoples. And that's where they start talking about these little flocks that are going to form before ultimately you're drawn into the, the same cloud. All right, so it's like, we'll be little clouds in the wilderness. <laughs> Although this cloud's getting bigger and bigger, <laughs> I've noticed. <laughs> this is the key. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Always yes. <laughs> our feasts and our Sabbaths are the key to breaking the power of the adversary. Because, again, it's whose feast do you want to engage? Is he your Elohim? Is he your God? Is he the Holy One? 
And he says, as it concerns this wilderness, again, as Yeshua comes and he's bringing this good news on the mountain that is contextual, at least, linked to the feasts. Keep your chagim. Keep Passover. Keep Shavuot. Keep Sukkot. Because that's the thing. We get so wound up over the minutia. And actually, in a nutshell, a kid can tell you how to be prepared for Messiah. An eight-year-old will tell you, keep the Sabbath, keep Passover, keep Shavuot, keep Sukkot. And if you keep it with the power of the Holy Spirit, you can have all the fun in the world hammering out the minutia. But it's this expectation as it concerns the hours or the hour until Messiah comes. Deuteronomy 131, it says, In the wilderness where you saw how the Lord your God carried you just as a man carries his son in all the way which you have walked until you came to this place. So Moses, is, he's bringing them to the brink of Israel. And by the way, you're not officially in Israel till you cross the Jordan. I know you can land in Tel Aviv, but scripturally it's crossing the Jordan that is your entrance. And there's a reason for that. It has to do with the springs where the Jordan originates, and it has to do with the resurrection bone, the loose bone. Um, I've got a book on that. I'm not promoting merch. I'm just saying there's a longer answer to that. At any rate, he, he brings them to a particular place for a particular reason. Because the understanding is that the Garden of Eden just withdrew a little bit when Adam and Eve sinned, and it's hovering just above the land of Israel. And if you look at the biblical boundaries, possibly it's extending that far. And you say, well, how can a realm match a natural place? I don't think it does exactly. I think it's doing more like that. All right? It's... Um, but it's the kingdom, it's something that often it'll talk about you go up into, but also talk about something you enter into. And the understanding is it's no higher than the height a dove would fly. That's how close it is. And if you've ever been to the Kotel, you know you're getting close before you ever see it. I like watching people. I'm a people watcher. I take people on tours, and if they don't, they've never been there before, and they don't understand that when we get down to that corner and turn the corner, they're going to just look down onto the plaza. I like watching them, and you can tell they just get real quiet, like they know. Before they see it, there's something in their spirit that knows we're getting closer and closer to a special place. In fact, it's the earth under the altar that it's thought that we were formed from. And in that sense, this is why everybody knows that's home. It goes back to our basic formation. That's why they're always fighting over it. Uh, one reason they're always fighting over it. But he, he's trying to bring us back to that place. As he forms us in the wilderness into these little flocks, where is the ultimate destination? Salt Lake City? Toronto? No. The ultimate destination is Jerusalem. It says, when we cherish her stones and her dust, they say Messiah will come. If we can see it in the natural realm and see what's not there, so much of our spiritual life is being willing to see what is not there. But it is there. You have to be like Abraham. He says, Abraham, get up, rise up, and walk the length and the breadth of the land. I want you to see this. Well, Abraham's already been in the land. Why does he need to rise up and see it? Because he was being shown the inheritance of his descendants, which is the resurrection back to the garden. That's the reward for Abraham. He says, I'm your shield. I'm your very great reward. I'm promising this to you and for your descendants, that if they have your faith, Abraham, then they will be able to enter back into the garden. I will make these dry bones live. And it's just it's so sweet to say, Lord, you know what you can do with these bones. You know what the plans are. He wants to bring us to that place. Um, we've got... Again, that, that scripture in the Song of Songs, my beloved is mine and I am his. But if you'll notice, that is a reciprocal relationship. 
Who do you turn to when you really need help? Stranger? You turn to somebody you know. You turn to somebody you trust. You turn to someone that you have walked with a few miles because you already know how they're going to behave and how they're going to come through for you. Now, people will surprise you sometimes, but nevertheless, I am my beloved, he is mine. It's, it's flipped in another part of the song, but it shows this reciprocal relationship. So we know Adonai does not need help, all right? He's everything. Why would he need our help? He wants our help. The same way we want his help and we need our help, he wants us to help him. So who does he turn to when he needs something on this earth? He turns to his beloved. He turns to the people who he knows, who walk with him. And that's what Yeshua says, I know we blow the scripture up, depart from me, I never knew you. But he's saying, walk with me, be my beloved. Be that trustworthy person like Abraham. All the things Abraham did, I wouldn't put that in the win column. But he still succeeded in those tests. Sometimes you succeed when you lose because you learn something through that experience and it doesn't impede your faith, instead it builds your faith. You do better the next time. And so the Holy One, he's going for this reciprocal relationship. Who will he turn to on earth when he wants the light of his word to go forth? He'll turn to the people who walk with him, who have that spirit inside of them. So we've got this relationship in Exodus. And if you'll notice, when he asks us for something, it, he's already supplied it. We're just giving it back to him. If he asks us for a lamb, he's already given us the lamb. And just kind of keep that in your mind. There, there is nothing he is going to ask from me that he has not already supplied to me. I may not think so. I might think, well, where am I going to find that? Where am I going to find that within myself? Don't worry. If he didn't know it was, wasn't already there, he wouldn't ask you for it. He has given you everything you need to be his helper, which is pretty cool. You don't have to dream it up, do it all by yourself. And so we see their father, Israel's father, destroying the gods of Egypt in the plagues. And then this is going to culminate in the 10th plague, which is the destruction of the firstborn son if there is no blood on that doorpost. And so we have Israel, the shepherd nation, helping, air quotes, helping the great shepherd. And how did they do that? They slaughtered lambs. They preserved their firstborn sons. They slaughtered lambs. But here's what happened. That's why I say you've got to see more than what we see. There's always more to it. And here's the question, Exodus 8:22. Behold, if we were to slaughter the deity of Egypt in their sight, will they not stone us? Do you see how they are helping the Holy One by taking this risk, by slaughtering the lambs? Because they understand something about Egyptians. When we keep this feast, when we keep Passover, when we slaughter the lamb, we will destroy their deity. What we did last night, it wasn't just having a fun meal and saying a few scriptures. Last night, we destroyed the deity. And this is what the feasts do. Again, they bring us back. Who is the one Elohim? Who is the one God? Who set the appointed times? Let's honor those appointed times instead of proclaiming other gods. And worst of all, proclaiming ourselves as God. Right? And so it's important. Why, do, why does the scripture keep taking us back to the feasts? He doesn't dream up new stuff just to see if we can catch up. From the beginning, from week one of creation, he has told us what to do to remain in relationship with him and to be prepared at the time of the resurrection when Yeshua returns. 
he doesn't switch stuff around us. It's kind of fun to do that to other people, but he doesn't do that to us. He stays on message. And so that good news is going to be proclaimed with the footsteps of Messiah. And remember that third relationship, the watchmen on the walls. They preserve the Sabbath, just like Nehemiah. He says, you're going to have to watch these gates or they're going to be desecrating the Sabbath left and right. And they should have learned better by now. Babylon should have taught us something. But here they go, in and out, in and out, on Shabbat. He says, let's stop this. Let's cut off the wicked one. Let's keep our feet from doing our own thing on Shabbat so we can proclaim him. What are we doing? We're cutting off the wicked one when we're obedient. That is how we're helping. He's given us what we need to do it. He gave us the scriptures. And so it's just up to us to do what he has already supplied us with. Let's look at Exodus 12, 3. Again, let's go back to the father relationship. So speak to all the congregation of Israel saying, on the 10th of this month, they are each one to take a lamb for themselves according to their father's households, a lamb for each household. Now, I put the Hebrew text in there for those of you who can read it because here's the key in the text. It says, le betavot, le betavot according to their father's households. How is the lamb going to be slaughtered? It's going to be slaughtered according to the father's household. All right, now, sometimes we just kind of skip over stuff and we don't really read in, in detail, but that's an important detail. There's nothing extra in scripture. I've never found anything in scripture. If it looked extra, it wasn't, right? He might talk about um, the hand of Adonai and then the arm. Well, that has a, a meaning. The hand is something that's probably going to happen very soon. The arm is something, it's a long arm of prophecy. So it, all of those things, they're not redundant. They're teaching a lesson. So it's going to have to be the house of the father that takes control of this process of slaughtering the lamb, the Passover lamb. And you couldn't just pick any old lamb. That's the message. Just any old lamb is not qualified to be the Pesach offering. And not just any man is qualified to offer that lamb. This Pesach offering is going to reflect the uniqueness of that verse. My beloved is mine and I am his. We help one another, not because he needs us, because we need to help him. We need to. So that sacrifice, again, it goes back to Nahum 115. Keep your feasts, O Judah. Right? Who is going to slaughter this lamb according to the father's house? Judah. They have to. It's not a qualified sacrifice if they don't. And this is how we've had so much trouble with anti-Semitism over the last 2,000 years. People fail to recognize that if Judah does not slaughter this lamb, it's not a valid sacrifice for the world. This is how we're going to preserve what was actually happening in the Gospels. There's so many details given in the Gospels and again, they're not random. They're pointing us to things. So the bloodline of the Lamb of God is going to include instructions on who's qualified to slaughter it. And if those requirements are met, then the nations can be redeemed. Then they can be incorporated into the blood covenant. And if we get that one thing, then it will defy replacement theologies. Because it's been a weapon over the years to say the Jews killed Christ. Well, last I checked, the Romans killed Christ. But did really anybody kill Christ? And if anybody killed Christ, who was it? Well, the, the plain language here is that the lamb the Lamb of God, he's going to have to come from an Israelite household. He's going to 
the, the hand that slaughters it is going to have to be of the household of the avot, the fathers. Who are the fathers traditionally? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Does so anybody know why they're buried at Hebron? It's said to be the entrance back to the Garden of Eden. It's said to be a message down through the ages to the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that there is a resurrection. This is the reward of Abraham. This was what was promised to his children when he arose and he walked into that garden and said, oh, this is it. This is how they're restored to their inheritance. And so when you go to Hebron, it's just like the Temple Mount. It's tense. You can't always get in there. It's worth going. Things happen there. Strange things happen there. And sometimes it's a dove that reminds you where you're standing. What a special place Israel is. When you go on a tour to Israel, it's not going to Disneyland. It's going home. And it's understanding what is all around you that Yeshua was talking about. Just the kingdom of heaven is upon you. Don't you understand that? If you're observing Passover, you're with him. You're in the kingdom of heaven. You're destroying the wicked one. How can he stand against that? How could he stand against what happened last night? He can't. It cuts him off. And this is how he knows his time is short because all these people who one day before didn't know what the Torah was, didn't know who Yeshua was, didn't know how to eat kosher. All of a sudden, they started keeping Shabbat, even before they understood it. They started figuring out what the Bible calls food. They started doing things like saying words like Pesach and Shavuot and Sukkot. And it wasn't like one person was in charge and said, this is what I need you to do and send money. <laughs> I tried. <laughs> Just spontaneously all over the world, people who didn't know of any Jewish bloodline woke up one morning and said, there's life in these commandments. His word is life to us. We need to find out more. And we are. We're finding out more. This has to be a sign. We, in every generation, you have to ask, what is the Spirit doing in my generation? And am I moving with it or am I about to get run over by it? Because it's going to be one of the two things. It's a special time. And so we have to walk humbly Again, it goes back to, is there leadership in the feast? Yes, there already is. We never lost it. We were lost, but <laughs> to that, we knew Yeshua, but we didn't know everything he was. And we're learning everything that he was. The more you learn of Torah, the closer you should get to Yeshua. And if you're not learning it that way, you need a new congregation. If you look at the liturgy, the daily prayers, the Amidah, it starts with a prayer called the Avot, the Fathers. And it's a resurrection prayer, by the way. Again, it's referring to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They're buried at Hebron. As a message to all the way down to this generation, there is a resurrection. In fact, the, the expectation is when you enter into the garden, Adam will greet you first, and it, he says he will greet you with joy. That's why I love when, when Yeshua asks Miriam, he says, woman, why are you weeping? Well, the angels ask her, woman, why are you weeping? She didn't know what garden she was in. Why are you weeping? Adam, it says, that's so cool in the Gospel of John, it's like there's two Yeshuas. She turns completely around to talk to the other one. But the idea there's, woman, why are you weeping? You're being greeted with joy because there is resurrection in that garden. There is still an inheritance there for us. And this is what Yeshua earned for us by being that lamb from the house of the fathers 
who have been teaching us resurrection in every generation since they lived. And so the Avot, it is a resurrection prayer. And then the very next prayer is called the Gvura. And the Gvura is also very specifically a resurrection prayer. The first two prayers of the daily prayers are both about resurrection. It starts with resurrection and it's going to end with resurrection, I guarantee you. It's a message to us. Don't forget what it's all about. So again, it's vital that Judah kill the lamb. And so yes, even though legally we can say Rome crucified him, that didn't kill him. In fact, he gave up his own life. He says, nobody takes my life from me. In fact, he's already demonstrated to us if he didn't like the situation and he didn't like the attitude, he'd just walk out of sight. He could go in and out at any point. That was nothing to him. You see him? Now you don't see him. If he didn't want to be seen, he didn't have to be seen. Do we have the same courage? When the pressure gets great, do we just want to shrink back and hide? Or when it comes time for, our, for us to take up our cross, will we agree to be seen and be part of that, that nation of sheep? And another passage that's always bothered me because it just didn't sound right, where they're calling for Yeshua's death and it says the Jews said, let his blood be upon our heads and upon the heads of our children. And a lot of Jews have been killed over that verse. I hope you realize that. But isn't that just exactly what we all had to say? If, if we are partaking in that blood of Yeshua, we're still saying that. We want his blood to cover our lives because we know only his death can atone for us. Only his. Now, could you do that? If you had been standing there that day, I'm sure there's lots of people there who didn't recognize him as the lamb. And they're legitimately saying, yeah, let his blood be upon us. He's not the one. But what if you were one of those who were throwing the palm branches down when he rode into Jerusalem? What if you knew he was the lamb and you stood there and they bring him out and you can see he's beaten, he's bloody, and you know what awaits him if you say, put him to death. Could you do it? Could you stand right there and look at your savior and say, kill him? Because if you don't kill him now, there's no hope for me. Well, if you've accepted Yeshua, you've done that very thing. You've accepted his blood as your atonement. I don't know if I could have done it. If I had to stand there and look at him and look into his eyes, I don't know if I could have. What a blessing to be this far removed from that moment because I don't have to look at him and say, go ahead and kill him. But that's what my sins did. And when I came to Yeshua, I had to say, I want his blood upon me. It's the only thing that will atone for the things that I've done or ever will do. That's the only blood. But we know that Yeshua slaughtered himself. He gave up his own life. And we share in that. He gave up the ghost at the time of his choosing. Nobody could kill him. We know that. But he was a lamb, and he was from the household of the Avot. He was their descendant, and he was slaughtered by his own hand at an appointed time that had been prophesied from the creation week. And I think of, you know, the, there's so much play between the blood on the doorpost in Egypt and the Shema. Just the way you put the blood on the doorpost, the idea of the mezuzah. Same thing with the Shema. 
You shall write it on your doorposts, on your gates. There is an equivalency of expression between the doorpost and the gates because it distinguishes this house. That's what that blood did. It says it'll be a sign. It'll be a seal for you. It'll be a sign for you throughout the ages. Why do you go to Jerusalem? Well, just imagine Yeshua walking through those streets of Jerusalem, carrying a beam, a tree. What if he fell right there at the gate and his blood dripped down the gates? What if it was that precise? What if it was that exact that his blood literally went on one of the gates of Jerusalem, like a mezuzah? He says, this is my city. This is for my city. I'll be back. And if you haven't been, go. Go and expect to see something that you can't see. But that's, it's part of the greatest commandment. It's part of your salvation recognizing what you can't see. So scripture, we'll try to move along here. <clears throat> it teaches holiness and time. Now, what is time in the heavenly realms? We don't know exactly, but we still know there is, I would say time in the heavenlies is real and we're living the parable of time. Because the trees in Jerusalem in that day, they will bear fruit every month, but there's no sun or moon to activate those typical cycles we experience here on earth. There is something inside of those trees that causes them to be on a time schedule, but it's not our time. So what we're doing in this parable of time is prophetic of what will happen in that time, in that day. We read of things in seasons, years, months, weeks, days, and hours, and they can be very confusing. And I would say, you know, the top five arguments that people like us run into has to do with the appointed times. But this is a day of joy, right? So <laughs> people arguing over the times. And I'm like, I think that's already been settled. We already read about Messiah and the footsteps, but anyway. You can get me later. Uh, if we look at how the calendar is set up, we go to the seventh month on the first of the month, right? We've got the fall feast, seventh of the month on the first of the month. And in that season, we know that you proclaim a year of jubilee. If you look at the fall feast, they're going to blow the, the great trump on Yom HaKippurim, and then you're going to release into a new year. And that causes people to stumble when they say, no, but wait a minute, back here is the first of the month. Nisan is the first of the month, or Aviv. They, some of them have nicknames. There's other names in scripture. How can this be the first of the month? But you're telling me this is the beginning of a new year. Again, it's because we're so concerned, we're going to make a mistake. We get very hyper-literal. And it's just like, remember the guy with the big fuzzy hair who did painting and he talked all hippie-like? Okay, that guy. <laughs> if you just listen to him talk, he'll tell you, okay, this is Sienna number five or whatever, and this is blue number, and this is platinum. And sometimes that's what we do when we study scripture. We break it down into the, the blue and the platinum and the Sienna. But when he's done, there's a picture, right? So what's the most important part of that picture? I'm glad I don't have to choose. I'm glad I can just enjoy the painting. And when we look at the way scripture is painting in terms of time, sometimes we get so obsessed with whether it's a month or a year that we've completely failed to look at the big picture. We miss the big painting and how beautiful it is. So I want to show you something. And just, I know, if your eyes roll back in your head and you fall over backward when I say Talmud, just warn the person behind you right now, okay? Because uh, we're going to read. Actually, we're not going to read from the Talmud. We're going to read from Vayikra Rabbah, uh, commentary to Leviticus 23:24, Because it's, it's ex 
expanding upon on the seventh month of the first month. It's going to show you something different about time. And it'll stretch our brain muscles when it comes to biblical time. It says, it comes out that you say on Rosh Hashanah, the first of Tishrei, in the first year, in the first hour, hour, man's creation rose in thought. He says, I'll create a human being on the, in the seventh month. In the second month, or hour, God consulted with the angels. In the third, he gathered his dirt. In the fourth, he kneaded it. In the fifth, he weaved it. In the sixth, he made it a form. In the seventh, he blew breath into it, which would actually be the first month. I'm going to show you a chart. It'll help. Because the month of Passover, the month of Nisan, is actually the month of breath. It's when he breathed life into us. Okay. In the eighth, he placed him into the garden. In the ninth, he was commanded about the fruit. In the tenth, he transgressed. In the eleventh, he was judged. In the twelfth, he was pardoned. The Holy One, blessed be he, said to Adam, this is a sign for your children. In the same way that you stood, in the same way, uh, you stood in front of me in judgment on this day and were pardoned. So too in the future will your children stand in front of me in judgment on this day and be pardoned in front of me. When? On the seventh month of the first month. Okay, so again, what's happening here? I'm, you're confusing me with sevens and ones and you're, you're talking about things I never read in scripture, but maybe you did. Maybe you did. Think of the book of Revelation. What's the big number everybody gets hung up on in Revelation? 666. All the books make the money on 666. Why is nobody buying books on the sevens? Are there not many more sevens in Revelations than sixes? And in fact, the sixes are just kind of a done deal because if you understand what happened on the sixth day of creation, you've already solved that man-beast thing. Move on. Now, granted, it does take the rest of the Bible to explain it, okay? But you've got the nutshell right there, right? Because man is the younger of the sixth day. He was created second. The beast was created first, so he's the older. The older will serve the younger, okay? Um, short answer. It's actually much longer, but at any rate, it's a telescope. It just keeps stretching out in terms of prophecy. If you don't understand the creation days, you're not going to understand the book of Revelation, by the way. You can't skip from there to there. Uh, but it introduces seven stars, seven angels, seven lamps, seven assemblies, seven spirits, seven eyes, seven seals, seven trumpets, seven bowls, seven thunder, seven kings, seven heads, seven plagues, seven mountains. But alongside, no, I read it. It's, you don't have to clap. <laughs> <laughs> but by the right alongside it 12 stars 12 gates 12 angels 12 foundations 12 apostles 12 pearls 12 fruits of the tree 12,000 first fruits from the 12 tribes 12,000 furlongs of the city so it wants you to understand 7 and 12 just like if you understand 4 you understand why do you only need 4 horses for 7 seals it's chiastic. That's how much of scripture, if not all of it, is written. It's written in a chiastic structure. And in that structure, it's what's in the middle that is the axis of what's on either side of it. What is the axis of the creation? The sun, the moon, and the stars, it says, for the sake of the Moedim. Right? It's the axis. Why do you only need four living creatures? Four seven spirits. And that's what we've been looking at lately. It has nothing to do with anything, but how does he shorten the days? How many times does he give you Passover and Sukkot pictures? Just like Pharaoh tells Moses, rise up you and your people and get out of here. At Passover, I know we're conditioned to think the Feast of Trumpets, Rosh Hashanah, firmly believe that. But it says he's going to shorten it for the sake of the elect. What if it's as simple as that? See, time there is not like time here. 
Why does he keep encouraging us to go back to the feast? He's taking care of us. He's telling you how to get into the tent, right? So what is an hour, sha'ah? I wanna wrap this up with showing you how these hours or these times correspond to what happened on the cross, just as an encouragement to us. So sha'ah in Hebrew, sometimes it is a literal 60 minute hour. And sometimes it's just a, a space of time. It's a special space of time, but it's just time. If we go again back into the lexicon, uh, it can mean to look at, to regard, to gaze at. So that it doesn't say 60 minutes right there, does it? Either the news program or the minutes. So sha'ah, it says, if we go back into Jacenius, it says it can be the twinkling of an eye. Sound familiar? In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, we will be changed. Well, what is shana in Hebrew? Again, we get wound really tight about, don't use Rosh Hashanah. That's not in the Bible. It actually is. It's in Ezekiel, but we'll argue later. <laughs> it's another way of saying the going out of the year or the turn of the year, which is explicitly stated in the Torah because it does have to do with that season of proclaiming the new year. Two things can be simultaneously true. Yes, it's okay. Relax. But Shana is not just the year, it means a change in Hebrew. So you're not a year older, you're a change older. <laughs> I'm claiming that one. <laughs> so a Sha'a can be an hour, or it can be the twinkling of an eye. A shana can be a year, or it can just be a change. It can be a transformation. So you see why Rosh Hashanah, which is the Feast of Trumpets, we would see that as a time of transformation, being resurrected from the dead. Our bodies experiencing a great change. Um, we can see first mentions of Sha'a, not as an hour, but actually back in Genesis 4.4 and Genesis 4.5, where it, it talks about the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. In other words, he looked at it, right? But to Cain and his offering, he had not respect. He wasn't regarding it. So as you look at where, what they're doing here, one brings the first of his flock, the other brings the, the fruit of the ground, but not the first fruits of the ground. That's why at Sukkot, they're given an instruction. When you bring in your first fruits at Sukkot, you set the basket down. And you say, behold, I have brought of the first fruits of the ground. I'm not making Cain's mistake. I want to be like Abel. I want to bring the best. I want to bring the first. So it's highly likely that they're bringing these offerings at the time of Sukkot. You say, well, there wasn't any Sukkot yet. I'm saying there was. Yes, there was. On day four. Remember, for the sake of the Moedim. How much did they know? I don't know that. But they knew to bring a sacrifice, as it says, miketz yamim, which is at the end of days. Literally at the end of days. So it's an appointed time for feasts, and he's having an, a respect or not a respect for their offering that appears to be a feast of Sukkot offering. But again, it's reciprocal. We need to bring sacrifices to him. We need to bring obedience to him. We need to help him. Just like you may not need Junior to patch a hole in the drywall, but Junior needs to learn how to patch a hole in the drywall, right? It's a skill. It's a life skill somewhere. Depends on how much damage there is to your drywall. But it's something you can always use just from personal experience. So, no. They don't necessarily need to do that that day, but yeah, it is a skill they need to learn. The father's the same way. He doesn't need our help, but he knows we need to learn. It's important. So the day and the hour are connected. So I wanna show you a few charts here, just to point out how two things can really function side by side without there being conflict. Because if we look at the, the month numbers, Again, we know the first of the months 
This is where we are, Nissan. But there's also this civil calendar that kicks off in the fall. And in fact, if you look at, at the way the feasts kind of iron out, things that are done on a smaller scale and the spring feasts are done on a much bigger scale. Nationwide, worldwide, Feast of the Nations, Sukkot in the fall. But you'll see if you put the two calendars side by side, your biblical first month and your civil first month correspond to the seventh months. So if you've got the biblical first month and the civil seventh month, one and seven. But if you go the other way and say the civil first month, then you end up in the biblical seventh month. And it's side by side, there's, there's no problem with that. None at all. Okay, now in the next chart, I kept that. And then I put down what I just read to you from Vayikra Rabbah about the hours. And remember, they're not literal hours. They can correspond to months. They're action times. So in the biblical first month where we are, Nisan, it says Elohim blew breath into man. And the second month, he was placed in the garden, but it's actually an hour. You say, make up your mind. I can't. <laughs> I can't. In the third, man was commanded concerning food. In the fourth, man transgressed. In the fifth, man was judged by Elohim. In the sixth, man was pardoned. And then in the seventh, what do you do? You go back to the creation, but in thought. You say, I don't, I don't see that in scripture. So we'll go to the third chart. If we look at the first month, again, we've got Passover. He's blowing breath into us as a nation. We're coming to life. We're resurrecting from the dead. Yeshua resurrected from the dead in the Passover season. We're looking at the resurrection of the greater body of Messiah in the seventh month. First month, seventh month, no problem. Y'all are looking at me like this is hard. There's no chart. Okay. Well, this looks great. I mean, <laughs> this makes perfect sense to me. <laughs> I tell you what, if they do get it up there, then, then take your shot with your camera. Otherwise, uh, you can find it on our old YouTube video somewhere. Um, but in the second month, it says man was placed into the garden, placed into perfection. What do we have? Well, in the second month, we count the Omer. We have the perfect sevens of the Omer. In the third month, he's commanded concerning food. Well, what do we have in the third month? He gives us manna. That corresponds. The giving of the Torah. We have Shavuot. We get the bread from heaven as well. In the fourth month, it says man transgressed. Well, we got the golden calf. In that month, we've got the tablets broken in that month. We've got judgment on the sinners in that month. We've got Jerusalem breached historically in that month. We've got the abominations of desolation on the 17th of Tammuz in that month. Um, the next month, man is judged by Elohim. This will be the month of Av when the temples are destroyed. Man was pardoned in the sixth month. This is when the time of Slichot began, the prayers for pardon, for forgiveness. And what happens, Moses ascends, he gets the second set of tablets. <laughs> and uh, at that time, he receives the, the full pardon for Israel's sin. And then that takes you right back to the seventh month and then the first of the year. Right, so that's as far as I wanna go with that. You can, like I say, take your picture of that and then you can go back through it later because we wanna close this out with these hours. So temple day is also 12 hours. I'm doing that just to bend your hour mind, okay? An hour is not necessarily 60 minutes. So a temple hour is from sun up to sundown. They break that into 12 segments. So it might be more than an hour. It's a space of time. And I think most of us learned in, in Christian reference books that Jewish daytime began at 6 a.m. and ended at 6 p.m. for counting hours. That's not true. That's an oversimplification, which sometimes helps if you're just trying to get a general idea. Um, at any rate, you have to think sun up, sun down, mark it into 12 segments. That's the hour. 
Each of those is an hour, right? So here's what, okay, here comes the Talmud word. Watch out if you're sitting behind, just get ready to catch them. It's like a prayer line. Uh, Avodah Zarah 3b, it says there are 12 hours in the day. During the first three, the Holy One, blessed be he, sits and engages in the Torah. He establishes his word. He affirms his word. During the second three hours, he sits and judges the entire world. Once he sees that the world has rendered itself liable to destruction, he arises from the throne of judgment and sits on the throne of mercy, and the world is not destroyed. So let's round it out like we learned in Sunday school. So let's say in general, because we don't have a way of calculating the day of Yeshua's death. I know somebody probably thinks they do, but we all know that person, don't we? So in general, like from about 6 to 9 a.m., what would be happening? The word would be affirmed, right? This is the time when Yeshua is going back and forth, right? The word is being affirmed. Finally, they come up with two false witnesses. From about 9 a.m. to noon, they say this is when he goes to the throne of judgment. That's not the throne you want. You want the mercy throne that was inside the Mishkan, right? From about noon to 3 p.m., you have the throne of mercy. That's going to be the sixth to the ninth hour. And then from 3 to 6 p.m., until the destruction of this last temple, they had nothing in that time slot. Now they say in that time, he instructs his children which takes us back again to that relationship in the Song of Songs. So let's think of it in terms of what happened to Yeshua. Mark 15, 25 says it was the third hour when they crucified him. Mark 15, 33, when the sixth hour came, darkness fell over the whole land until the ninth hour. Mark 15, 34, at the ninth hour, Yeshua cried out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which is translated, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And typically, Psalm 22, 1 and 2 is associated with that hour of the throne of mercy. And that's where you hear, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And that verse 2, Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's associated with the Torah portion, Kitisa. And remember, this is where Moses goes back and he's advocating for the mercy throne. He says, they can't stand under your judgment. Please judge them with mercy for the sin of the golden calf. And I'm going to read this out of the art scroll. Exodus 34, 6. Hashem passed before him and proclaimed, Hashem, Hashem. God, merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abundant in kindness and truth, preserver of kindness for 2,000, forgiver of iniquity and willful sin and error, and who absolves, and you know how it goes on. But here's what Rashi commented to that. He says, this is the attribute of mercy. He says, when you see this doubled, Hashem, Hashem, yod he vav he, yod he vav he, when you see that, it's the attribute of mercy, or rachamim. And the pronunciation of the name refers to his mercy before you sin and his mercy after you sin and repent. What are we saying? I think Yeshua knows this. Because at a particular hour, at a particular moment, he says, Eli, Eli. He knows it's associated with this particular passage. I need your mercy for these people. Because he's saying, I am these people. This is what I represent. I need your mercy before they sin. I need your mercy after they sin and repent. And that's what Yeshua did for us. He pled for us. Before you ever sinned, he pled for you. Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani calling upon that rachamim, upon that mercy that Moses begged for. And I think Yeshua knew the hours of the throne, and he knew the hour of the throne of mercy had come. And he, like Moses, he's appealing to the Holy One on behalf of the world to arise from that throne of judgment and move over and sit down on the throne of mercy. 
Just like he says, once, they see the, once he sees that the world has rendered itself liable to destruction, he'll arise from the throne of judgment and sit down on the throne of mercy. And he says, Rashi writes, it's inappropriate to say to the attribute of judgment, why have you forsaken me? It's spoken when he arises to the mercy throne. Yeshua knew exactly when the Father stood up. And he knew exactly when he was going to sit down on a throne of mercy, and he begged for us to be pardoned. So from 6 to 9 a.m., that first hour, he was crucified. From 9 to noon, the throne of judgment ruled, and darkness fell over the face of the earth. From noon to 3 p.m., from six to the ninth hour, the throne of mercy. And at the time when the, the hour of the throne of mercy was just finishing, that's when Yeshua gives up his life. He says, it's finished, it's done. And then he descends into that open grave of the serpent's wicked mouth. And he starts preaching. He starts preaching. And you know what they say after the destruction of that temple? He says, now, in that fourth segment of time, now he instructs children. And what did we say to start out? It's the relationship between the father and the child, the sheep and the shepherd, and the watchman. And that's what it says. Since the destruction of the temple, he instructs his children in the fourth segment segment. So I hope that's an encouragement to you. Yeshua knows your times. It's up to us to know his. It's up to us to get on his schedule because he's given us everything we need. Passover, rise up, Pharaoh says. You, go. Go with, go with what you got. Just get out of here. That's one rising. Where does he take you? He takes you to the mountain. He takes you to Shavuot. And you say there as a nation, we will do and we will hear. Because you remember it's kind of good faith. When you put the blood on the doorpost, they didn't know nearly what they would know at the mountain. You say, I, I agree to keep walking. And you know, the, the understanding of the fall feasts, everything I've read, the rabbis say that Yom Teruah, Rosh Hashanah, to Yom Kippur, you've got 10 days of repentance. They say, that is not so much for the righteous. They say they're already sealed over by Shavuot. They enter into Sukkot of glory or clouds of glory at Pesach. You enter into a cloud. Look around. Do you see a cloud? <laughs> you enter into the clouds of glory, and that will carry you. Where? It'll carry you through. It'll carry you through your wilderness. It will take you to the mountain. It'll take you all the way to Sukkot. They say that those fall feasts are more for the, the intermediates, is what they're called, for people who they, they're kind of standing back waiting to see if Yeshua wins before they really commit to taking up their cross, is the way we would put it. Well, let me tell you, Yeshua does win. He's already won. And that's what they say. Don't, don't wait until the fall feast. Rise up at Passover. Go to the mountain at Shavuot. You'll be sealed. And then by the time the fall feasts come around, it's, it really is. It's the twinkling of an eye. That, the time is short for the righteous. But Yeshua says to Laodicea, which is the seventh assembly, he says, I wish that you were hot or cold because this lukewarm thing isn't going to work anymore. And that's what we have to proclaim to the world with all kindness. Remember, he's the God of mercy. And he's still sitting on a mercy throne. But there is an appointed time. And we need to proclaim these appointed times to the world while there's still time. It's important. Stay
understand wherever you are saying my family makes it so hard for me my coworkers make it so hard for me put a band-aid on it and limp along all right get in that cloud because you know it's not a natural place. They acted like it was natural. That wasn't natural. Their clothes weren't wearing out. Their shoes weren't wearing out. Bread's falling out of the sky. That is not natural. <laughs> but see, when they thought it was, they acted like it was. But when you were convinced that you were walking in clouds of glory, you will have the faith it takes to be right there where Moses took us. You, were, you have been brought to this place as a father carries his son. And that's why your shoes won't wear out, right? And you'll arrive with really good skin because clouds moisturize. Uh, <laughs> but that's just it, don't wait. If you know what your citizenship is, if you're a child of Abraham, he will know you because that's the next thing that happens, they say, when you go into the Garden of Eden, Adam will greet you there with joy and then you sit down and you recline at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And that's what Yeshua said to the Sadducees who didn't believe in a resurrection. He says, many will come from the east, the west, the north, the south. They are going to sit down at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and you will see it from afar off. But you won't enter in. Because you can't see the resurrection today. You won't be able to enter in. They'll still know. Like, wow. Okay. If you're a child of Abraham, act like he's still alive. If you're a child of Yeshua, if you're a child of the Father, act like they're alive. If he's on the throne, act like he's going to judge. Act like he is judging. You've got all that mercy available to you from the throne of mercy. But he expects us to walk as though he's alive. And because he's alive, we are too. So stand firm in that and let him restore to you the joy of your salvation because it's going to be a, an awesome walk from here to Sukkot. Let's thank Alyssa once again. Thank you, Alyssa. I told you that you would be going, hmm. Here's one thing I want to key on just real quick before we we're about to dismiss. Um, I, what she said about that he doesn't need our help, but he wants our help. And we need to help him. That resonates with me because from the very beginning, we know that he has always chosen to work in and through his people. And we have been honored, those of us who are in this generation, we have been honored that he has chosen to use us and, and to work in and work through us. Amen? And all of us, don't we, we want to stand before him and, and hear him say, well done. Let's be those kinds of people that it's spoken of Joseph, uh, excuse me, Joshua, that he left nothing undone that was given him to do. So we need his spirit to lead and to guide us step by step. Amen. Thank you, Halissa. Thank you so much for that. Um, this is uh, the time when uh, Beth would usually be here and she would share some prayer requests and, and praise reports and things like that. And she's not here to do that. But I do have uh, a praise report that I do want to um, to mention. And this was, uh, this is from Sangwan. And on behalf of her husband, my name is Tom Matunas. I'm 80 years old. And at the age of 75, during this 2017 Passover, I was diagnosed with stage four lung cancer. I immediately started searching for a good doctor. Uh, found two of them. But my spiritual doctor, Yeshua, and one of his helpers, he gives the doctor's name. Uh, and then he said, um, he began certain therapy. 
And then it says that uh, in Dece December of 2021, I received the report that I am cancer free. And then it says, heal us, Abba Yahweh, and we will be healed. Help us, and we will be saved. For you, you are our praise. Grant complete care and healing to all of our wounds. For you, Almighty King, are a faithful and merciful healer. Abba Yahweh, I thank you that according to your word, your son, King Yeshua, He took my infirmities, bore my sickness, and by his stripes I am healed. And I know that you have plans for me to prosper, to be in good health, even as my soul prospers. You are my great physician, and the Abba Yahweh who heals me. As I anoint myself with oil, I receive the healing virtue of King Yeshua, the Messiah, in every area of sickness and disease in my mind, body, spirit, and soul. Thank you that in the name of King Yeshua, he... He anointed me by his stripes and I am healed. And then it says, thank you, Jacob's tent family. So I just wanted to, to read that. Tom has been, Tom has been dealing with that for a long time and, and is now healed. All right. For those of you who have prepared and have a willing heart, we want to give you an opportunity to come and present an offering to the Lord. And so if you would do that at this time and then we are going to after that receive the blessing and then we will be dismissed so were, were you playing what I thought you were playing what do you, well what were you playing we'll play the song what, what, which one you got alright we'll do it there's an old song I like to sing from time to time. And I want you, if you know it, I want you to join me. There's a sweet, sweet spirit in this place. And I know that it's the spirit of the Sing it one more time. Without a doubt, we'll know 
that we have been revived when we Well, Martha, I thought they were going to sing Hebrew music. That's tonight. Seven o'clock, our brother Paul Wilbur will be ministering, and I think his daughter-in-law is going to be, Che is going to be joining him as well, and so we want you to be back here. What time will the doors open tonight? The doors will open at six o'clock, and so you want to be here, get your seat. It will start at seven o'clock-ish. Doors open at 6.30. Oh, that's right, that's right, that's right. So the doors will open at 6.30, and so we'll start at 7. You know how we do things around here. 7, 7.02, 7.04, 7.05, something like that. But we're going to come back and have a good time. So as you prepare to go, just um, I, our, uh, the cafe is going to be open for those who, somebody talk to me. The cafe will be open for those who brought lunch and everything, because we're not doing Oneg like we typically do, but that'll be available to you. If it's not raining, there's places outside where you can sit. Uh, but these doors will be shut, and, and so you need to take your things with you. Have you had a good day? Okay, immediately after we dismiss, if you are um, youth, they're gonna have a meet and greet over here with Carmen and Jeremy Dahl over here to, the, to my left. So that'll be a brief meet and greet, right? 10 to 15 minutes, okay. 10 to 18 ages. I didn't hear that. 10 to 18, is that the age? 10 to 18 years old? Okay, so they're gonna meet over here for just a few minutes. All righty. Um, thank you for being patient and flexible, and we're just kind of going with the flow this weekend. Amen? <laughs> All right, please stand for the blessing.
Again, we want to say Shabbat Shalom. And so will you one more time turn around and face that camera back there. All of the folks who wanted to be here with us today who cannot, let's wish them Shabbat Shalom. And we love you. Thank you for joining us. And so as you prepare to go to lunch, we're going to still, can you help? Thank you. We're still gonna do Kiddush together. Way to jump in there. I said, way to jump in there and help. Join me. Baruch Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Borei Puri Hagafen Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who creates the fruit of the vine, and for giving us Yeshua the Messiah, who said, I am the vine, and you are the branches. L'chaim. Oh, that's a lovely loaf today. It looks smaller for some reason. Who made that one? Um, I can't pronounce the name. Baruch Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Hamotzi Lechem Min Haaretz Amen Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth, and for giving us Yeshua the Messiah, who said, I am the bread of life. And I guess I'm supposed to pinch off a little bit. Mmm. <laughs> Shabbat shalom, everyone. Go in peace. Be safe.